Just when it seemed the tide had finally turned in Theresa May's favor, an embarrassing defeat in the House of Commons. The nose to the left, 305. <laughs> Dissident moderates within her own party pushing through an amendment that gives Parliament greater say on a final Brexit deal. Just one week ago, the British Prime Minister had managed to unite the whole of uh, the Conservatives with an 11th hour deal on terms of divorce with the EU. Her poll numbers had even gone up. Now the PM is back in Brussels for a two-day summit to rubber stamp that phase one deal. But it's anyone's guess whether she has the clout to secure phase two, a post-Brexit uh, deal on uh, the future relationship with Europe. Well, if the infighting back home persists, could even call into question that open land border deal between the North and the Republic of Ireland. Will that infighting in London derail Brexit negotiations? Are the differences within the Tories irreconcilable? Could Britain be headed for a big, uh, for a political big bang like the one witnessed here in France this year, with a complete redrawing of the political map? Some of the questions we're asking in the France 24 debate. And uh, joining us from London, Barrister Francis Hoare, committee member of Lawyers for Britain. Welcome to the show. Good evening, Francois. Uh, Josh Lowe, staff writer at Newsweek magazine, who uh, pays attention to European affairs. Thank you for joining us. Hi there. And uh, here in the studio, Christian, Christian Liken, uh, who teaches at the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po. Among the courses you're teaching this semester, the uh, art of diplomacy? Is uh, that how you right. characterize this is, it? This is one of the courses. One of the courses. All right. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24 debate. Chin up, stiff upper lip, the British Prime Minister expressing disappointment upon her arrival in Brussels and emphasizing there have been 36 votes on Brexit in the Commons and she's won the previous 35. Alex Jennings revisits Wednesday evening's events. I'm very happy to confirm to my right honourable friend that we will put the final withdrawal agreement between the UK and the EU to a vote in both Houses of Parliament before it comes into force. It was a final bid from Theresa May to stave off defeat on a key Brexit bill, but it didn't pay off. The eyes to the right, 309. The nose to the left, 305. <laughs> Parliament has voted that every single agreement reached with the EU on Brexit must first be approved by MPs. A blow for the British Prime Minister, who fears that their involvement might make a smooth exit from the EU unlikely. But for the 309 members of Parliament who voted for the amendment, Theresa May can't call the shots alone. Parliament resisted tonight and won a vote which says there has to be a proper decision by the British Parliament on the terms and what happens over the negotiations on Brexit. To add insult to injury, the amendment was tabled by 11 rebel MPs from within Theresa May's own Conservative Party. There's a time for everybody to stand up and be counted. As Churchill said, he's a good party man. He puts the party before himself and the country before his party. And that's what I intend to do. It's a defeat for the Prime Minister that might complicate negotiation talks. Factions within her own party, who only just held on to power after this year's snap general election, are coming to the fore over how Brexit should be handled. And after Wednesday night's vote, well, there was the uh, usual Thursday morning doorstepping of cabinet ministers. Mr. Gove, very nice to see you. Negotiations. <coughs> I hope you have a lovely Christmas. Does the Prime Minister still carry the authority to deliver a deal? It's a nice morning, isn't it? Very nice to see you. Is hard Brexit sticking through your fingers, Mr. Johnson? Are the Remainers taking back control? Is the Tory party tearing itself apart over Brexit? Um, I get the feeling uh, uh, on that score, uh, Francis Hoare, that uh, the door to Boris Johnson's car closed before he, he could answer that one. Is the Conservative Party tearing itself apart? No, I don't think so at all. Um, I think there is a difference of view that is completely understandable um, about the procedure by which we leave the European Union and the procedure, more importantly, um, and specifically by which we provide for the security and the continuity of law after we leave. 
Um, what's important to remember is that this um, debate is all about Clause 9, which will become Section 9 of the Act. That allows ministers before, but only before exit day, that is to say before um, the day on which, two years after the Article 50 notification was given, we leave the European Union, it allows them to make provisions, but only those provisions they consider would be necessary before leaving. After that, they aren't permitted to make those regulations under the Act and under the Bill as it is. Um, and so it's a very limited provision. Those regulatory powers that ministers have are obviously subject to a vote in Parliament. Um, they are um, subject to a scrutiny procedure and, of course, the Bill could be amended to enhance that scrutiny procedure. Um, and subsequent to the United Kingdom leaving the European Union, even during the transition agreement, there will need to be a new Act putting into domestic law the provisions of the um, article of the, of the um, agreement between the United Kingdom and the European Union. That is what this is about. Um, the difficulty with the amendment, at least potentially, um, is that the provision of Article 50 is that the United Kingdom leaves the EU automatically after two years, unless that period mm -hmm. is extended. Um, it's very unlikely that this agreement would be concluded um, until quite, um, a very short period before the United Kingdom leaves. Right, so it, the tighten, it, it, it tightens the deadline, Francis, and uh, we heard Luxembourg's Prime Minister today in Brussels wondering, like, even with what was agreed to last week on phase one, is that going to be back up for scrutiny inside the Commons? Exactly. I, I, I mean... It, it, it is something that goes both ways because, of course, whatever agreement comes before the House of Commons as a concluded agreement, which under this new amendment, the Dominic Grieve Amendment, would need to be passed by primary legislation, that's to say an Act of Parliament, um, before uh, the United Kingdom, or before that, that, that um, any, anything, any provision under that agreement could be put, put into domestic law. Um, it, th th once that um, has happened... Um, what exactly is going to happen if the, if the United Kingdom uh, Parliament refuses to endorse it? Mm. Um, it? That will have been the agreement that the European Union will have agreed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to be put before the House of Commons. Um, uh, what, what will that do? Uh, effectively, it's going to make it far more likely that the United Kingdom leaves without even a transition agreement. Um, and remember that these provisions... Um, in the in what's now clause nine, allow a minister to ensure the the smoothness of an exit. Allow the minister to provide, for example, for airline regulations, to provide for any necessary border regulations, to provide for any necessary area of law that, without the withdrawal agreement um, coming into force in law. Uh, would be rendered w without legal effect. That, right, that's so there, a very there's disturbing a possibility, uh, possibility of a gridlock of, uh, of, of, the, of a hard Brexit if, if there's too much uh, fighting inside uh, of the Commons. Josh Lowe, have, have you gotten the lay of the land? How, how are people feeling about this? Is it a victory for uh, democracy, uh, Westminster having more power, or is this uh, uh, simply uh, taking Britain back to the cliff edge? Well, I think in one sense, um, it certainly is uh, a, a sort of re-levelling of the power lines between um, Parliament and the executive. It is a slight return of power to Parliament. Um, in terms of the political kind of fault lines on show here in the Conservative Party, I don't think the party is tearing itself apart, but there are di uh, divisions and differences of opinion within the party. And what we saw with this vote um, was the more kind of, um, I, I don't want to call them pro-EU because everyone in the Conservative Party, or almost everyone apart from one of the rebels, is, is in favour of Brexit. But the more kind of soft Brexit side of the party um, is now having its turn to cause trouble. A lot of those people have made noises about rebelling before but not actually rebelled. Um, this is a time uh, when they did actually rebel and they did deliver a blow to the government and it means the government is going to have to watch them a little bit more in future. I think one reason for that is partly uh, not exactly the government's fault. Um, we have here in, in, uh, in Britain um, the, the two papers, the Mail and the Telegraph, um, which both uh, heavily support Brexit. Those papers have gone in very hard on some of those people even before they'd actually uh, carried out any rebellion. That to some extent has 
lessened the risk of them carrying out rebellions. It's made them more bold. It's made them more gutsy. It's made them think, well, if you're going to paint me as a mutineer, I'm going to mutiny. Right, and then, it then, does mean that there's just another flank of people for Theresa May to watch. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned those headlines. Let's look at one of them and talk about bitterness. The Daily Mail uh, calls uh, those uh, uh, 11 Tory rebels self-consumed malcontents pulling the rug out from under their EU negotiators, their leader, their party, 17.4 million Brexit voters, and most damning of all, increasing the possibility of a Marxist at number 10. Uh, for more on this, let's now go to Manchester. Sajad Karim, Conservative member of the European Parliament, your reaction to that Daily Mail cover? Well, good evening uh, from Manchester. Uh, our press, or certain parts of our press, uh, certainly is uh, making a habit and has been doing for quite some time uh, about providing misleading headlines and stories when it comes uh, to the European Union. So this really doesn't come uh, as any change of tack from them. It really is business as usual when it comes to the European Union. It doesn't surprise any of us uh, that they are using such extreme language to try and force their own agenda. Uh, as I say, it's business as usual, no surprise. It, really? I mean, it, the, the, this is making those 11 MPs marked uh, men and women. Well, absolutely, and this is the same press that did the same with our judges. It's done it with uh, a number of our MEPs and a number of our MPs. Uh, both of these publications that you mention and others actually have a, a track record uh, over many decades of publicising false and misleading stories when it comes to the European Union. Here, of course, there is clearly a direction of travel and a change in culture by identifying these people in the way that they have, putting their pictures uh, on the front page and using these sorts of labels uh, simply in order to try and stir ill-feeling towards them as individuals. This is something which is new in our culture, but it doesn't surprise any of us anymore in the slightest that yeah. these uh, publications are willing to steep to such low depths. Uh, Christian Lequen, uh, something new in our culture, says Sajad Karim. The UK, known for its moderation when it comes to politics, uh, does this signal a new turn for its politics? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure it's really true, you know. Uh, I, I know everything about, uh, well, what we said uh, on uh, British politics, which is made of pragmatism, etc. But when you look at the debate, uh, not only in the five uh, in the last five years, but also in the tw twenty five last years about about Europe, uh, the, the the debate which was launched by Thatcher, for instance, about uh, European integration, it was very ideological. It was not pragmatic at all, you know. And when you look at the uh, argument used by the by the the Brexiters. Uh, it was highly symbolic, you know. We talked about our great history, our sovereignty, uh, the defense of our nation, etc., etc. That has nothing to do with pragmatism, you know. This is uh, this is symbolic uh, uh, politics. So uh, I think when uh, when Europe is concerned, the, the debate in the United Kingdom is highly ideological, as it is probably in most of the of the EU member states now. All right, when we come back, we're going to pick up on, on these points and see uh, just how weak or strong Theresa May's hand is going forth. You're watching the France 24 debate. This report has been awarded the Ricardo Ortega Memorial Prize 2017 of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Revisited. Presented by Stuart Norville. Freed from jihadist occupation in January 2013, Timbuktu has struggled to recover. Despite the permanent presence of French and Malian forces, the threat remains. Ongoing intimidation and the presence of jihadist sleeper cells are a cause for concern. Can Timbuktu cast out its demons and wipe away the stains of occupation? Revisited on France 24 and francevancat.com.
You're watching France Van Gad, I'm Marco, and these are the main world news headlines. The US says it has proof Iran violated UN resolutions in Yemen. Iran, meanwhile, says that evidence has been fabricated. Clash over the migrant crisis, the EU once again split on how to cope with the thousands who are still trying to find a better future by coming into the bloc. Putin speaks, Russia's president defending his record in the annual staged and televised question and answer session in Moscow. A four hour long unchallenged plug for his presidential re election bid in March. He afterwards spoke with Donald Trump, who he defended during this broadcast. At least four children have been killed when their school bus was struck by a train. It happened near Perpignan in southern France. Eleven are in critical condition. President Emmanuel Macron is promising all help that the families might need. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Stay with us. You're watching Front Snack Cat. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 a debate, a crucial EU summit to rubber stamp uh, the uh, divorce deal between uh, the EU and the United Kingdom taking place in uh, Brussels before they go into what could be even a harder lift, which is defining the future relationship between Britain and the continent. With us to talk about it from Manchester, uh, Conservative member of uh, the European Parliament, Sajad Karim. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to uh, uh, attorney Francis Core Barrister, who uh, specializes in election and public law and is a committee member of Lawyers for Britain. Also in the UK capital is uh, Josh Lowe, staff writer for Newsweek magazine. And here in the studio, Christian Lequen, who teaches at the prestigious French political science institute, Sciences Po. Uh, earlier in the week, before uh, that uh, setback in the Commons, Theresa May triumphantly asserting that uh, even that phase one of the agreement could be called into question if negotiations on a future trade relationships were to go south. I have repeated it in my statement just now that uh, this, is, this offer is on the table in the context of us agreeing the partnership for the future, agreeing the next stage and agreeing the partnership for the future. If, uh, if we don't agree that partnership, then this offer is off the table. Uh, Josh Lowe, does this mean that... Uh What's being rubber stamped uh, in Brussels on Friday isn't really sealed? Well, it, it's sealed insofar as it's the end of the first phase of talks that will eventually lead to a binding deal. Um, both sides, by the way, it's not just the British government that says <coughs> the first side is, is not uh, sort of immediately legally binding in the strictest sense. Um, the Commission acknowledges that as well. Um, what's been agreed so far is a good basis. Um, both sides have come uh, to a, a, a a, an agreed position on several key issues. Now they've got to move on and cement them in a much wider framework. And that framework has a lot of battles still to come. Before we get even to trade talks, we've got to agree uh, the transition, the length of transition. Does EU law apply in the UK after transition? Does uh, freedom of movement apply? All these other things. Then we get on to the framework for a trade deal, which opens up a whole ton of other cans of worms. Um, so really what's been done so far is, is good, solid progress. Um, it shows goodwill. It show, it, it, it's better than the worst that many feared, um, <clears throat> but we're by no means there yet. By no means there yet, but by already agreeing to phase one, one article in Politico claims that uh, the UK is losing a, already a bit of its bargaining a power, most notably when it agreed to the amount of the divorce bill. That robs them of their key leverage for securing a trade agreement deeper than the EU's bottom line offer, a Canada-style deal uh, when it comes to trade, or Canada Dry, as Brussels officials are fond of calling it, for dry read, no special financial services access, uh, which, of course, would be, what, Christian, a disaster for the city of London? Yes, well, I, I don't think we're going to have at the end uh, an agreement which is the same than the one we, we sign, the EU sign with Canada. Uh, we will have more for, for one obvious reason. The uh, United Kingdom has been a member of the European Union for 45 years, <coughs> so there is uh, a, a huge harmonization of the norms, of the standards of, uh, of the uh, 
uh, United Kingdom with the EU law, even if the United Kingdom now uh, um, got off the, uh, will get off the uh, uh, European Union. So, of course, I know that Mr. Barnier used uh, this argument. Uh, uh, the basis for negotiation will be uh, the, the, the agreement with Canada, the free trade agreement with Canada, but I think it was a negotiating position. Uh, at, the, at the end, we will probably have something between uh, the uh, uh, well, classic uh, uh, free trade agreement and the single market, something, something ad hoc, you know. So you're confident that there's going to be a deal, that we're not, there's not going to be a no I deal? So. Our hard I way. think so, yes. It's, it's in the interest of, uh, of everybody that we, we get a deal at the end. Uh, Sajad Karim, of course, we talked about it in part one of our discussion. Uh, the criticism is, is that uh, it's the UK Parliament that's slowing down the chances of a deal uh, by making uh, the uh, negotiating process more open to scrutiny by lawmakers. Do you agree with that? Uh, no, I don't, um, for a number of reasons. And, and first and foremost is this, that uh, when people voted in the EU referendum, they voted in order to ensure that uh, the UK Parliament was re-empowered and this is by far the most complex of negotiations that our country is undertaking, probably in its modern history. And there are going to be real and direct implications for our citizens uh, in terms of how our economy will operate after the UK leaves the European Union. And that's going to have a direct bearing on people's everyday lives. And therefore, there simply cannot be enough scrutiny of the process. But then along with that, we have a secondary issue, and that is that the European Parliament has a say on whether this deal can be approved or not. And that is an absolutely binding say. And it is quite wrong that the European Parliament should have such a say, but the national parliament of the country that is actually exiting finds itself in a situation where it doesn't have a proper balance and proper transparency check system in place, which is what now exists. Francis Hoare, you agree? Uh, no, not entirely. Um, Theresa May, I, I think you saw a brief reference to it um, in her speech towards the end of the debate yesterday, uh, offered as a compromise uh, a resolution of both Houses of Parliament. Now, I appreciate that that, of course, is not the same as legislation. Uh, but what, let's look at what this um, amendment would actually do. It would require a statute approving the uh, withdrawal agreement. It wouldn't be a statute putting it into place. As far as, far as I, my reading, certainly my reading of the um, Dominic Grieve amendment is that, um, it would simply be a statute authorising it. Now, a resolution in both Houses of Parliament could have a similar amount of debating time to that. Um, the difficulty with the amendment as it is um, presented and as it was voted on yesterday and at the moment um, the bill will go through with that amendment um, and so we may have to live with it but the difficulty is um, that uh, as um, uh, Sajad knows um, the, uh, the, 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 the agreement will only come to the UK Parliament for that vote and for that piece of legislation um, if and when the European Council has agreed to it, um, to its terms. Um, and, and so it's, it's difficult to see what this piece of legislation and this amendment will do other than make extremely complicated and difficult the last stage of the negotiations. It will not be, unfortunately, meaningful scrutiny of the negotiating process. It will be at the end of the negotiating process. The difficulty with negotiations like this, no. and unfortunately there's absolutely no way around it, the difficulty is that you cannot have a direct involvement of Parliament in the way that would be perfect and would be desirable because, firstly, the process takes only two years. That's a result of the provision itself. We can't do anything about that. It's very unfortunate. It's far too telescoped, but that is as it is. And unless um, a unanimous vote in the European Council allows that to be um, that process to be enhanced and um, to be extended, we can do nothing about that. That's the first point. And the second point is 
inevitably, negotiations will take place between the two parties, mainly through officials um, and mainly through ministers. It's very difficult, and I, I completely understand the need for scrutiny over it and for oversight and for as much knowledge and information as possible. I completely appreciate the need for that. But the other difficulty is there, are an, there is a need for this negotiation to proceed, and it will have to proceed, as it has done in stage one, through the officials that are charged with the negotiations. That, unfortunately, is how international agreements come into place. Parliament, of course, will have an opportunity to scrutinise this legislation um, when it comes to uh, yeah, but then, then but when, 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 the, when Parliament when Parliament takes it up, it's just going to yeah, be at the are. very end. It's going to be take it or leave it. Well, that's the they same are. as under the Grieve Amendment. All the Grieve Amendment can do is throw it back to the European Council and the European Parliament mm. and the and the British um, negotiating team to debate. It can't do anything else. It will do so maybe in October next year when we will have five months or so um, to in, enact can, and conclude the negotiations. Can't do unless, anything else. Sajid if, if, Karim, if, let me example, ask you about Luxembourg, this. If Luxembourg yeah. vetoes an extension of the negotiating period, we won't be able to do anything. And under the Act, under the bill as it is, the ministers will not be able to put through regulations which allow us to have a smooth transition to Brexit. Sajad, it's Sajad an Karim, your thoughts on this? Situation. No. No, the, 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 this is a fundamental misunderstanding of the actual processes and procedures that will work. I think the first point to recognise is this, that without proper <coughs> national parliament's involvement, the chances of the European Parliament actually turning around and saying we reject this deal are far greater than if the national parliament has carried out a transparent and democratic exercise to say this is our position. So if we find ourselves in a situation that the agreed position comes to the British Parliament and is approved by the British Parliament, that gives it the legitimacy it needs in order to come before the European Parliament. And whatever observations MEPs may have, it will be incredibly difficult for them at that stage then to turn around and say, we are going to reject what has been agreed by the heads of states and approved by the National Parliament of the United Kingdom. So that's point one. Second point is this. Actually, it doesn't mean that it, as and when this comes to the British Parliament, if the British Parliament rejects the offer that is before it, that that automatically leads to a situation of the United Kingdom falling out without an agreement. It does not. What it means is that all other options must then be explored, including, of course, renegotiation of the points that will be identified by the British Parliament as needing to be addressed. It could also mean the extension of Article 50 in order to provide more time if it is required. And, of course, the British government has as a, at its disposal the unitary right to withdraw Article 50 if no, it chooses to do so. And it would be well within it its doesn't. rights to actually do that. And then, fourthly, the European Union is very dynamic when it comes to... Uh, almost inventing solutions to problems. <laughs> That's what we are extremely good at at an EU level. And if this sort of situation was presented to us, I'm afraid we would disappoint many of the hard Brexiteers in the United Kingdom by providing a solution at the proper time. All right. Uh, I, Francis Hoare is saying it's not true that there's going to be a, a stopping of the clock on Article 50 or a, a, a revocation of it. Josh Lowe, uh, what are your thoughts? I think that um, while to some extent uh, Francis is correct that this does this amendment does raise the possibility of a slightly chaotic or, or sort of dangerous a scramble in the last minutes of the negotiating timetable. Um, another reason why Brexiteers are worried about this is that, um, in my view anyway, uh, what this amendment does is slightly increases the chances, um, if there is a deal, um, of it being a slightly softer deal. The weight of opinion in Parliament um, is for Britain to leave the EU, but for Britain to maintain quite a close relationship with it. Um, so therefore, by having to pay more more consideration than they otherwise might have done, even though only fractionally more, really, consideration uh, to the opinions of MPs, um, you may end up with a slightly softer negotiating stance. You may also end up, of course, in the situation where they do reject the deal. As Sajid had said, 
it is theoretically possible that it might then end up extending uh, the timetable if, if the council all agrees to it. So, And, and because general, the likes, um, let me ask you on that point, the likes of uh, Boris Johnson, uh, Michael Gove, uh, who uh, since there was that breakthrough a week ago, uh, have been supportive of the prime minister. Is that a sense that they've come around to this idea of a, of a softer Brexit or is it simply that they're biding their time? Well, at this point, nothing that has been um, agreed uh, gives an enormous amount of detail about exactly how soft or hard Brexit is going to be. We know we're leaving the single market and the customs union, um, but we don't know much else about how much uh, access to those things, how close a relationship we're going to have afterwards. So, so really, at this point, um, everything has sort of been a delicate dance to ensure that no one has to tread over their own red lines. But the point about Parliament more widely, the MPs on the backbenches on both sides of the House. The broad swell of opinion there is for Britain to leave the EU, but to maintain pretty close links with the EU. And after this amendment, the government is going to have to pay fractionally more uh, attention to that sort of position. Christian, again, seen from this side of the, of the channel, it really seems touch and go, right? There was uh, the, the Irish Parliament that kept us in suspense. There was the Northern Irish... Uh, 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 a cons uh, conservative leader who kept us in suspense. Uh, now, uh, the infighting with the Tories. Your thoughts on this? Well, this is this is typical uh, uh, of uh, what is going on now in the EU. The strong interdependence between domestic politics and uh, European politics. Uh, and it's interesting the way our, our British colleagues see that is is purely domestic politics, you know. Uh, but um, we. Uh, could see that uh, uh, all this discussion about the right of the of the uh, national parliament, uh, uh, the Grieve Amendment, could have an impact on the macro project of the European Union, and this is a limit for it the could other. Could be a spark for that. This is, the, but this is a limit for the other member states. I very much agree with the remark which was done by our colleague in Manchester that uh, the EU is very good for inventing. Uh, solution, but with a certain limit. Uh, we, uh, we cannot spend all the uh, time and all the agenda uh, talking about Brexit. I mean, uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, um, Macron's proposals, uh, uh, probably uh, the uh, uh, agenda of the next uh, uh, German government, uh, one of the ideas is also to move forward with the reform. So we cannot be a prisoner from the British debate, you know what I mean. So, um, uh, okay, we are always prepared, I think, uh, uh, in the EU to renegotiate, to extend uh, a bit the negotiation, but, 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 we cannot spend all the time talking about Brexit. Can't, can't spend and, all the time. Uh, at a certain should... stage, Brexit will have to uh, find an end. That's my point. You, you, you were talking about the right now. There's soul searching going on in Germany over their coalition. Here in France, we we had a. Uh, a political big bang with uh, uh, the victory of Emmanuel Macron, which uh, splintered the, the the other parties, both to the left and to the right. Over in the UK, since World War One, it's mostly been a, I guess you could call it a two and a half party system. Uh, the Conservatives and Labour dominating, sometimes the Liberal Democrats in yellow there in this chart, having a bit of a show, but that's not been as much the case uh, of late. Sajad Karim, the arguments that have been going on at Westminster now since uh, the Brexit referendum, are, are they the prelude to a political Big Bang in the UK? Could the parties uh, split or change or could new parties emerge? I don't see that uh, at the moment. I think the mood of the British people is that they want to see uh, our parliamentarians carrying out their function of delivering the referendum result. The issue is defining what that actually means. Now, as the process is moving forward, uh, people are beginning to discover much more about what it actually means to leave the European Union and what it means not to be in the single market or the customs union. Uh, and people are beginning to see the effects of what may emerge of that happening. Uh, and therefore, m our, our public is more and more becoming engaged on how they wish to see does the that, definition of does what that mean that someone like yourself has more actually means. You're a conservative. Does that mean that someone like yourself 
has more in common with dissidents within the Labour Party uh, who uh, oppose Jeremy Corbyn than with uh, those who back Theresa May within your own party? I don't think that's strictly true. Uh, but certainly uh, when it comes to Europe, uh, Europe is one of these issues in British politics, I am afraid, which uh, has really um, been uh, one of the uh, defining moments of division in uh, all of our, uh, well, in both of our major political parties here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and what we are seeing at the moment, of course, is a hard left that has uh, control of the Labour Party. Uh, and therefore, a lot of people from the centre-left of the Labour Party uh, do not feel connected to their leadership. And, of course, their views on Europe are far more in tune with uh, those people within the Conservative Party that are seeking to find a pragmatic solution to where we are today. We're going to leave it there. I want to thank you uh, very much, uh, Sajad Karim, for joining us from Manchester, Francis Hoare Pleasure. and Josh Lowe for being with us uh, from you. London. Here in the studio, uh, Christian Leken. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we say hello to uh, Emma James. So the squabbling within the Conservatives, according to that Conservative uh, member of the MEP, is not going to lead to a big bang in British politics. Nonetheless... You'd think it when you peruse the papers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. And certainly Brexit has done more to divide the United Kingdom uh, than pretty much anything, I think, uh, certainly in recent history. Um, and Theresa May was given a poison chalice when she, this challenge for her was to actually bring this home and get a deal. Um, Christian Adams in the London Evening Standard has come up with this cartoon and you can see she's flying the spirit of authority back to Brussels because, of course, last night's vote um, where members of her own party went against her um, and she lost that and a lot of people saying she lost an awful lot of authority along with it. But there's such swings, isn't there? Because obviously it wouldn't have been this cartoon if the vote ha had been different after her good week last week. Yes, absolutely. She must have felt um, incredibly deflated last night because she had just clawed back uh, a bit of ground and was starting to feel like she was getting somewhere with Brexit ne negotiations and the rug has very firmly been pulled from under her. Um, one thing that's interesting to note coming out of Europe today, uh, the Austrian Prime Minister Christian Kern mm. has gone on record saying uh, that he thinks Brexit should be cancelled. It's just bringing up too many problems, uh, problems that he thinks uh, are not easy to solve and he thinks that there will be more to come as well. It's and not... hogging too much of the limelight was the point Christian Lequen was saying. Absolutely, because Europe isn't just about the UK and whether or not it stays within the EU. And it, it really is dominating an awful lot of conversations. In some ways it has to, but it also means a lot of other things are being left aside. Um, now, you mentioned the press coverage of uh, what we saw after last night's vote. And there's one front page which you've mentioned already, the Daily Mail, which really uh, got so much attention. Uh, this proud of yourselves headline uh, with all of the um, 11 uh, Conservative Party MPs who voted against um, party lines, as it were. Um, some people are very unhappy about it. Others have come up with a way of uh, coming up with an alternative. This one, a rather festive one. Proud of our elves, um, mm. <laughs> this one says. Uh, and there are, of course, reindeer antlers on all of the people above. Uh, this one, I can't show you the top bit because he's used a rather naughty word, but technically Ron has come up with this. Democracy is bad when it doesn't fit our bigoted narrative. Now, the Daily Mail is very much for mm. Brexit. Um, absolutely. So it seems. Yes, very much so. And they're doing nothing to hide it. And most of its readership probably very much in agreement with what they had to say on that front page, viewing these people as traitors. Uh, many of the MPs themselves have taken to Twitter to put their point of view across. Um, in answer to that question, uh, proud of yourselves, yes, we put our country first, exerting British principles of democracy and free speech. You should try it sometimes, says Anna Subri. Uh, Sarah Wollaston, too, um, saying, this hysteria is a thing to behold. It's not going to block Brexit, for goodness sake. Just make it a softer landing. And that's what a lot of them are saying, that this isn't about stopping uh, the democratic choice of the British people. This is about ensuring um, that there is some parliamentary control over what happens. Um, 
one of the other uh, MPs retweeting that image of them uh, with the reindeer antlers. Uh, and also BuzzFeed talking about the fact that Nikki Morgan, um, one of those MPs, has said that she believes this kind of at attack really backfires because you may remember there was a, a front page of The Telegraph where they were labelled the mutineers. And she feels that really actually rallies people behind them um, and can actually work a little bit against uh, what the Daily Mail's objective is. Um, looking elsewhere to some of the reactions about this front page in particular, uh, this Twitter user saying one can't help but worry that it's this kind of aggressive bilge that helped sow the seeds of Joe Cox's murder. She, of course, was the politician murdered by a very right-wing man who was not happy at no. all about the idea uh, of... of Brexit being stopped, uh, wanted to stop all immigration and the like. Um, other Twitter users saying things like this, um, it's time to reclassify the Daily Mail. It's not a newspaper. It's a purely far-right propaganda tool. And there are some of the examples of their recent front pages. Crush the saboteurs, enemies of the people. Um, they do very much put themselves there as judge and jury on these matters, it has to be said. Uh, another one here saying that uh, this is how the Daily Mail reports the restoration of parliamentary sovereignty and democracy. Now, of course, there are plenty of people who do agree with what the Daily Mail has to say. Of course, Brexit went through uh, because the majority of British people voted for it. Um, in reaction to the vote, Nigel Farage, of course, the founder of UKIP, uh, whose raison d'etre was to get the UK out of the EU. Uh, my contempt for career politicians knows no bounds. Lots of people pointing out that he himself is now something of a career politician. Um, but this is just an, an ordinary Twitter user responding to Nigel Farage saying, no way am I going to vote for those so-called top three parties again. The people voted to leave. The MPs voted to remain tonight. Disgusting. Using the hashtag drain the swamp. Uh, borrowing the uh, term from Donald Trump. And it's interesting to see as well that a petition uh, which is calling on the government to leave the EU immediately and not wait for any more negotiations, right. that is gathering steam. Um, in just a day, it's gone up by over 13,000. Um, so a lot of people really reacting to that vote but it, it is all split the same way as it has been right from the very beginning. Gosh, the, the campaign of a year and a half ago still being uh, relived. Uh, many thanks uh, for that, uh, Emma James. I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.